Father, once more, we thank you for your wonderful mercies towards us. We thank you for your love. We thank you for sending Jesus. We pray that we may continue to study, to listen, to meditate, to understand what you're saying to us. May we see that the plan is much greater than anything we've ever imagined. Help us to see how everything fits together and that when one part is gone, it destroys the whole thing. Bless us as we see what you want us to know in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Today we want to take a look at two of the most amazing statements ever uttered by human lips. And the thing that makes them so amazing is that both of them are inspired by God the Father. And we're going to look at those statements to see what it is he said through these two people. Now what we're going to try to understand in the next few sessions here is the difference between reality and nonsense. Reality, of course, only comes from God. But men are always into some sort of nonsense. That's just the way it's always been. And the most capable, intelligent, theological minds have missed the realities of God. Because men, when they read the Bible, they don't read the Bible the way God wrote it or had it written. They read it the way they want to see it. And we won't get into all the things involved with the creeds and churches and all this stuff for right now. We want to leave that for now. We want to see what did God really say in these two amazing statements. Now, going back last time, remember the witness of God is greater than men. That's all men. The witness of God. And we looked at just a couple things he said. Today we're going to see two more things he said. There's another witness. Who was that? He said, I'm going to be a God. And people can take my witness. <laughs> and of course, he has been busy in this world doing his witness. And apparently, mankind has believed his witness instead of God's witness. And the real issue is, who is going to be worshipped? God has his witness. And then this counterfeit God has his witness. And so our question here is, which one are we going to worship? Now, did you notice the way I said that word one? Which one? Not which three? There is no such question as which three. That is a false question. It's which one? The only true God? Or the imposter who pretends he's three? See? So there is somebody that says they're three, but it's not the Father. He never says, I'm three. But the other one, the imposter says, I'm three. We'll come back to that thought as we move through what we're doing here. Now, the witness that we heard last time said that he has a literal son. That's the witness of one God. The other God 
says there is no literal son. So we have two witnesses. One says, I have a literal son. He's my beloved son. And the other God says, there is no such thing. That's a metaphor. Because I am the God of the metaphor. I am the son. I am the Father. I am the Holy Spirit. There I am. Three of me. But there's only one. So we have a three in one God and we have a one true God. But they're both one. See that? They both are one. And they both are real people. Okay? They're real persons. There's not, nothing fake about the Father. There's nothing fake about the other God. He's a, a real person too. So we are going to decide which one of these are we going to worship of these two beings. So then, at the present time, you have a witness in your own soul. You either have the witness of this is my son, or you have the witness of there is no son. There's no other place to go with this. You believe one or the other. So let us go to John chapter 6. And let's start reading at uh, verse 65. It says, He said, Therefore, said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my father. From that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will you go away also? You're going to go away now? Then Simon Peter answered. And of course Simon Peter is always the one answering. <laughs> there could be twelve standing around, but it's him going to be in the Bible. <laughs> All right, then uh, Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe, and we are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Have I not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? Oh, I think we better stop reading right there. Peter, speaking for the eleven, not the devil. Did you notice that? Peter, speaking for the eleven, said, We believe, and we're sure. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. There it is. There's the statement. That's what we're going to look at. Okay, let's go to John eleven twenty seven. This is uh, the raising of Lazarus. We know the story, Martha and Mary and all of that. Let's read uh, from verse 24. Martha uh, saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus saith unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth me shall never die. Believest thou this? Verse uh, 27. She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. There it is again. 
There it is again. Thou. Now, please notice, both times here it's been in a conversation. They did not learn this from a book. They did not learn this from a rabbi. They did not, did not learn it in any place. They're talking to Jesus. And they say, thou art. <laughs> All right. Let's look at this one more time. Matthew 16. Let's see. Where should we pick this up? Um, verse 13. Verse 13. That's a good place. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they gave their answers. But verse 15, after they gave their answers, he saith unto them, But whom say ye <laughs> that I am? Here's the conversation again. This is the conversation. Verse 16. And Simon Peter answered. There he goes again. <laughs> and Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. I think that's all the further we're going to go right now. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now this statement that we have read three times is the basis for all the true doctrines in the Bible about God. This is the basis. And this is the separation between reality, truth, and myths. Now what we have happening here is a thus saith the Lord. We're not going to theologians. We're not going to scholars. We're not going to go to school for four to eight years. We have the simple word of God. Thus saith the Lord. And when God says something, that's it. Period. There's nothing more to talk about to a Christian. Now, of course, everybody who professes to be a Christian is not a Christian. There are many people who, who think they're Christians, but when they want information, they don't go to the Bible. They go lots of other places. Yeah, that's right. Now, I'm not going to get into that because that's a series of lessons all by themselves. Going someplace else instead of the Bible. Now, because God has said it, thus saith the Lord, that means it's unchangeable. So if he said it one time, that's it. It will never change. Did you remember that Alan White says, quoting the Bibles, there will be those who depart from the faith. See? You can't depart from God. You can't do that in His Word without being lost. You either stay in His Word or that's that. So let's begin looking at this little statement. The first word that was said was the word thou. What does that mean? Thou. Yeah. You. Well, when they said thou, who is you? It's Jesus. Which you? Is that an abstraction? Is that an idea? Is a what? What? What is you? It's him standing right in front of them. That's who you is. 
Now, the you standing right in front of them, what is that? Who do they see? They see a man. A man. They don't see a glorious being. They see a man that looks pretty much like them. He's a man. So who are they looking at? And they say, you, it's the man, Jesus. This is very important. You, the, the one we're looking at, the one we walk with, the one we talk to, the one we know. You, you are the Christ. Now we have taken a monstrous leaf here. You, this man, we know. You are the Christ. What does Christ mean? The anointed one? The Messiah? You are the one that God promised he was going to send. You, the one we're talking to, you are the Christ. You are the incarnation. You are the incarnation. Well, what does that mean? You're not just a man. We're looking at, there's something else going on here and we see that, we know it, we're sure about it. You are the incarnation sent from heaven to save us. You. Now, if Jesus is gonna save anybody, what does he have to do? He will have to do several things. But the only way we're going to be saved ultimately is not what he did on the cross. That was the sacrifice. But there's something more that has to happen. If the cross is all there is about the plan of salvation, we are all lost. Every one of us. Because the only thing that happened at the cross was the blood. In the plan of salvation, what comes next after the blood? You have to do something with the blood. And there's only one person that can do that. It's the priest. The priest. If you don't ever get to the priest, there's no plan of salvation. That's what's wrong with Sunday keeping. Oh, every one of them think all you need is the blood. No. The blood does not save anybody. The blood has to be applied. Exodus 12. Okay. The blood has to be at the right place at the right time. We're going to try to study that for a while. Because that's called the atonement. And do you know the atonement was never made in the courtyard where the animals were killed? Never. There's no atonement in the courtyard. It has to be in the most holy place. See? There's no atonement with just blood. We're going to spend a whole meeting on this. But for right now, I'm trying to lead you to the next point here. Jesus, the man in front of him, who is the Christ sent by God, is the mediator. That's the whole point. He's the only mediator between man and God. First Timothy. So, what Peter said is bringing all of this information with it. It's just loaded what he said. Well, Jesus is the mediator. Now, if Jesus were the Trinity, who would he be mediating between? <laughs> himself and himself? <laughs> How can anybody come up with that kind of a thought that Jesus had to be a mediator between his human self and his God self? It's just a crazy thought. And it's just one of many absurd thoughts that we're going to try to bring out as we start going through this particular series to understand what 
the Trinity actually is and why it teaches what it teaches. So Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Savior. He's the mediator between man and God. And so they said, you are the Christ by virtue of the fact that you are the Son. Now we all like that part because we've been dealing with that, but there's a whole lot more to it than we have been able to talk about yet. In Proverbs, the eighth chapter, we have a famous verse well, I, I got my brain took me there first. We don't want to go there first. Uh, Proverbs thirty. That's that's where I wanted to go. That that's in keeping with what we're talking about right now. Proverbs thirty. Verse four. Who? hath ascended up into heaven or descended who has gathered the wind in his fists who has bound the waters in a garment who hath established all the ends of the earth what is his name and what is his son's name <laughs> if thou canst tell so here we have in a scripture that many people know about two different people. The one who does all these things who anybody can know this is talking about God. But this particular God according to the scripture has a son. <laughs> he has a son. John 1.18 No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. So over in Proverbs it says God has a Son. And here in John, who is the same person who wrote verses 1 of chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the, God, and the Word, and, and, uh, the word was God. He just says here in the 18th verse, these are two different people. In the same chapter. <laughs> no man has seen God, but, but we're seeing His Son. I mean, it was more obvious than that than people on this earth have seen Jesus. Now, if Jesus was the Trinity, nobody saw him. <laughs> Do you see how silly the Trinity is once you begin looking at the scriptures? We have seen the Son, but nobody has seen God. <laughs> Now, the only thing you can make out of that is Jesus was not, not God. He was not divine. I don't know of any so-called Christian that's willing to say that. So there's something wrong with the thinking. It's not staying with the scriptures. So Peter said, thou, the man that's standing right here in front of us, that we all know, and you look just, just about like us. So, so you're a man. Thou art the Christ. You're not just what we see. You're the Messiah. The Son. Oh, the Son. He's really a Son. How could Peter, James, John, Matthew, any of them doubt what the word Son means? Did you read in any of their writings where they ever said, 
It's not really true, folks. We're just writing that because God told us to write it. But it's not really true. Don't, don't, for, don't really believe that. Have you ever found anything in Alan White's writings that ever said, well, the Bible says the son, but he's not really a son. Did you ever find that one? I think there are reasons none of this ever shows up. <laughs> the Bible says Jesus is the son. John 20, 31. Now this is John writing, and he says this over and over again. It says, um, but these are written, these words, that you might believe. That Jesus is the Christ. Okay, he's the Messiah. He's the anointed one. He is the Son of God. That, that's the next words. He is the Christ, the Son of God. And that believing, you might have life through his name. <laughs> You have to be a believer that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. You have to believe that or you're not going to get salvation. Now that sounds to me pretty serious. Now I don't want to get into what a person needs to understand to have salvation. That was not my statement. My statement is John's statement here. That believing you might have life through his name. We will talk more about that when we get to the atonement because there are people who think that because Jesus died on the cross, anybody who believes in his name can be saved. But if a person believes in his name, something's going to happen biblically. And Jesus knows whether it has happened or not. And there has to come a time when he has to say it in front of the universe. Whether this person is really a believer or not. That did not happen at the cross. That's still in the future. So nobody can say because they believe in the cross that they're saved. Nobody is saved until Jesus says so. And the Bible tells us at the time he's going to do that for every person. Again, I'm, I'm moving ahead in my mind because I really want to get to all the doctrines of the Bible that the mastermind imposter has taken away from Christianity. Yes, they're no longer there and they're fast disappearing from the Seventh-day Adventist church. He's the son of the living God. Well, now we're getting someplace. Second Corinthians, verse 16. What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple. Okay, pick up the thought here. What agreement does the temple of God? And we think of the temple of Jerusalem. No, it's not talking about that. Yeah. God's saying, you are the temple we're talking about. You're where God lives. You. You are his temple. You are the temple of the living God. Well, if we have two People out there who say they're God. How do we tell the difference? We're starting to get back it up here. The real God is the living God. We'll see what that means in a minute here. The living God. He says, they, I will be their God. 
I will dwell in them, walk in them, they will be, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. First Timothy three fifteen. No, three yeah, three fifteen. But if I tarry long, he wants to visit them. He says, but if I tarry long, that thou mayest know us how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Well, he just told us who the church is. It's not the building. I think everybody knows that. But it's not the organization either. And hardly anybody knows that. The church is not the organization. It's not a denomination. It's not people who take in the money. It's not the people who hire the ministers and pay them to say certain things. The church of the living God is his people, the true Christians. But notice, to them, he is a living God. Not an abstraction. Not some kind of strange idea to think about. Acts 14, verse 15. Verse 14 for context, it says, Which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people, crying out, saying, Sirs, why do ye these things? We with you of like passions. We are also men of like passions. It says, uh, We preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God. Now he's going to give us something to work with. The living God which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> Why do you think God told us to say those things? The last people on earth. Because it's the only way you can figure out who the living God is. Now you know who the imposter is. <laughs> the living God is the creator. So notice, thou, Jesus, standing in front of us, you are the Christ, which we can only know by faith. You are the Son. You are not the Trinity. You are the Son of the living God, the Creator. The Creator. What is the sign of His creatorship to His people? The Sabbath. Do you see what's in this statement? And we're not picking all of it up. We're just picking out the obvious things. Thou, a man in front of us, art the Christ, the Messiah of God, the, the Savior, the Mediator, the only one that can come between man and God, the Father, to make us come together. You are the son of the living God, the creator. Which means, if you know he's the creator, you are a Sabbath keeper. This is the real gospel. This is what we were supposed to be telling the world. All of these things. This is our message as the remnant people of God. This is an amazing statement, isn't it? We're just beginning to pick out what's being said here. How did Peter get so smart? <laughs> How come he knows all of this? Let's go back to Matthew 16. 
Okay, we're down to verse uh, 17. Jesus had asked them a question. Peter has answered the question. Now Jesus is going to respond to the answer. Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee. You didn't go to church to get this one. You didn't have Bible studies to understand this. You didn't have rabbis, ministers, whoever. You didn't have seminary professors to teach you this. Uh, flesh did not tell you this, Peter. But my father which is in heaven. This statement all by itself destroys the Trinity concept. My Father, Jesus said, my Father, a Trinitarian cannot believe in that statement. They don't believe Jesus is the Son of God. If he's not the Son of God, then how can he have a Father? But Jesus said, Peter, your answer came from the same place that I get my information. From my father. <laughs> because he said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Now he told you, he told you now the truth. That I am the Christ, the son of the living God. Are you getting this? God has revealed the identity of Christ through Peter to the world. And Jesus said, blessed are you. You didn't get this from any human. God himself put it in your heart. And so Peter now has the witness in himself and his own soul because God has witnessed to him. And Peter has believed it. And Jesus said, you're blessed, Peter. You're blessed. <laughs> there is a father. And there is a son. That's all there is to it. We've just been reading the Bible. John 6, 57. Verse 56 for context. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. What is Jesus really saying here? If a person has Jesus, he has the Father. And if he has the Father, he has Jesus. You cannot have one without the other one. They reveal each other. <laughs> so when Peter said that, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, he was saying, there's the Father, there's the Son. <laughs> it's unmistakable if we just were to read the Scriptures. Now, if there is no Son of God, who is the Christ? You can have no Christ without the Son. There is no Christ. Because the only Christ there is in the Bible is the one who is the Son of God. 
And if you take away the Christ, you take away the Son, you also take away the Father. Because you can't be a father if you don't have a son. <laughs> Is that right, Terry? <laughs> you, got, you have to have a son. Then you, you're the father of that son. So all three of these realities go together. Christ, the Son, the Father. You take one of them away, they're all gone. All of them. And the fake God knows it. That's why he's done what he's done. We're going to do a lot more talking about this. Who this imposter is and what he has done to the world. And what he has done to destroy Christianity, at least the Christianity of the Bible. And when you no longer have the Christianity of the Bible, it doesn't matter what you call yourself, your church is no good for anything. You have a fake church. The Bible has a name for it. Apostate. Once having the truth and then walking away from it is apostasy. And we better stop playing games nowadays. We better know what we're dealing with. Because there is a true God who has a son. And there's a spurious Fake God who told us I'm going to be God who doesn't have a son. So then, if the Bible in this inspired statement of Peter is telling us there is a father, there's a son, and that son is the Christ, what does it say about Jesus who walked around on this earth? Why did he come? Does the Bible tell us anything about that? God so loved the world. He gave. He gave. Jesus says, My Father sent me. My Father sent me. Jesus had to have the approval of the Father or He would not have come. Yes. The Father gave His permission. They went into council meeting together. They talked it over three times. They discussed this. And it came out, the Father is going to send me to earth to save mankind. Jesus volunteered, surely. It's His desire. He loves man. But it would not have happened if the Father said, no, we have to think this over. So, there is the Father, there's the Son. The Father is the source of the Son. How can I make a dumb statement like that? The Father is the source of the Son. Have you ever heard of a Son being the source of the Father? I mean, let's, let's get back into reality. There is no demonstration anywhere in the known universe that you can have a son be the source of a father and people say well that, that isn't what that means that's a metaphor come on now let's get past this metaphor thing people who are believing in metaphors are going to be in big bad trouble because jesus either told us the truth or he didn't and if you want to believe that jesus only said metaphors you have a big problem and maybe people have a big problem anyhow because he said, go and sin no more. Oh, that's just a metaphor. I think someday we're going to find out. He meant exactly what he said. Go and sin no more. Jesus is the only begotten son. And of course the scholars tell us that word begotten doesn't mean begotten. They just tra change every word the Bible uses to suit themselves. But a person who reads the Bible and believes what it says is going to know begotten means born. It doesn't mean unique like we're being told. So Jesus, if he is born of the Father, what does that mean? Did Jesus, did the Father go out someplace and dig up some dirt and say, I'm going to make another deity out of this? 
<laughs> no, he didn't do that. Did he do that with Eve? How did, how did Eve come to me? Out of the side of Adam. There it is. Out of God himself. A part of himself. He brought forth his son. He is of the same substance. Now I hope people are realize they should not use theological terms to understand the Bible. And one of the theological terms that's floating around right now is consubstantiation. Please don't use that word. You can, you can think you know what it means, but I don't think people know historically how that word has been used. Don't use consubstantiation. Use the real thought, substance. Jesus is the same substance as the Father. He came from the Father. He's part of the Father. But just as a child is born in this world, once that child is born, it's no longer part of the mother. That child is its own person, its own personality, its own character, its own everything, has its own spirit. And Jesus, once he was a personality brought forth, he was his own character, his own person, and he had his own spirit. I don't know why that's so difficult, but there are people who've done a lot of study who are still aren't clear on this. Jesus is his own spirit. There are people out there teaching that Jesus only has the spirit of the Father. That's not true. That is not true. And people start figuring this out or else they're going to have a problem again. We're being told all kinds of strange things today instead of studying the Bible. Jesus is his own person. Hebrews 1. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Here's Paul telling us it's not the Father. It's his Son. Now we're going to have to figure out what that statement means. It says, uh, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So the Father is the creator, but he didn't do it by himself. He did it by Jesus. That's in several places of the Bible. Who, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Oh, there's two different persons here. And one's an, an image, upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had himself purged our sins, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. On the right hand, it didn't say he was the one sitting there. It, that it's his throne. He's sitting at the right hand. Verse 5. Oh, what did I miss? 4. Being made so much better. Made. Did you, did you catch that word Made. It didn't say he was inherently. It says he was made. So much better than the angels as he had by inheritance. Ah, now we got it. There's the word. Inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For into which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. In verse 8 it says, But unto the son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever. Why does the father call Jesus God? Inheritance! <laughs> What's your last name? What was your father's last name? How come you had the same last name he had? <laughs> What's so hard about this? Thy throne, O oh God. You have my name. And God is in the name. The name is Jehovah. Jesus' last name is Jehovah. <laughs> he is not Jehovah the Father. He is. Emmanuel, Jehovah, which is 
God with us. The same family. Jehovah. But there is one true original Jehovah and that is the Father. Well, I don't want to get into all of that either. The important thing here in Hebrews is that Jesus, by inheritance, has all the attributes of God because he's the Son. So, God is seen in Jesus. When we see Jesus, we see all the attributes of God. Mercy, love, all the attributes, justice. We don't live our justice. Jesus had just as much justice as the Father. But there's a part of this that most people leave out, and we ought to look at it before we close today. John 8.42 Jesus said unto them, If God were your Father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth, and I came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. What does that mean, he sent me? Who's in charge? <laughs> Is that clear? The Father sent Jesus. Has Jesus ever sent the Father any place? Do you see it? It's only one way. It can't be another way. If Jesus is the Son, the Father says what's what. That means Jesus is in subjection to the Father. It's a willing, loving, voluntary thing. He is in subjection because that's who he is. He is the Son. <laughs> and people try to say, well, that makes him inferior. What in the world are these people thinking about? How can a God be inferior to a God? <laughs> Jesus is omnipotent, the same as his Father. How does that make him inferior? Before he came to this earth, he was omnipresent, just like the Father. How does that make him inferior? He was omnipresent. He knew all things, just like the Father. How does that make him inferior? This inferior thing comes from the Sunday keepers, and that's where Frum got it from, and he put it into the Seventh-day Adventist Church. That's why we say it now. And when I say we, I mean the organization. I don't mean the people who know what the Bible says. He sent me. Verse uh, 28, same chapter. Then said Jesus unto them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am He. And that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father hath taught me, so I speak those things. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. There it is again. Total subjection. Jesus does what pleases the Father. He sent me. That's what he sent me here to do. <laughs> to keep his commandments. We'll talk about the law at some length in, in uh, just a little while. We're easing up to some subjects there. To the law of God. Why the law of God is so important. And we're going to see it's so important. 
that he had to send Jesus to take care of the problem. We're going to see what that means. 1 Corinthians 11.3 Well, that's while he was on earth, people were saying. But what about, what about now? Well, what about now? 1 Corinthians 11.3 But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is the man and the head of Christ is God. <laughs> the Bible is so clear on all these matters if we just take time to read what the word of God says. The head of every man, the head of every woman, the head of Christ himself is God. Did Jesus believe that? Does he still believe it? Yeah, right now, the head of Christ is God, the Father. You can't do that with Trinity. You can't do it. It's impossible. The Father and the Son are two separate beings. They each have a form. They each have a personality. The Trinity people deny all of this. They deny everything we've said today. And we've just been reading Bible. Let's read Matthew 18.10. Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. So where is the Father? He's in heaven? Where was Jesus when he said this? On the earth. Is heaven and earth the same thing? Well, how can the Trinity, who is supposed to be one person, be in two completely different places? Well, you, you can't do that because either Jesus came to the earth because he's inseparable from the Father and the Holy Spirit, or they all three came. And we are going to spend some time here discussing the question, who died on the cross? I'm trying to ease up into that. I want to show you biblically what the answer is to that. But Jesus said something here. He just didn't say my father. He said the angels do what? They see the face of my father. The father's face! <laughs> Trinitarians don't believe that, that God has a face. The Father has a form. Do you remember somebody asking Jesus if the Father has a form? Yeah, early writings 55, Alan White herself asked the question, does the Father have a form? And she said, well, I'm... The express image of the Father. <laughs> I have a face. He has a face. <laughs> this is Jesus the Divine talking to her. About the Father the Divine. They both have faces. They have forms. They're two different people. John 5. Verse 37. And the Father himself hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. <laughs> the Father has a shape. He has a face. He has a personality. We won't get into all of those scriptures that say the Father has a personality. Psalm 40, verse 8. We all know the psalm. I delight 
to do thy will. Is that a personality trait? Jesus delights to do the will of the Father. Oh my God. God is his Father. His Father is his God. <laughs> Jesus has a God. My God. Did he say that another time? He said that several times in the Bible. Yeah, we all are familiar with that famous one at the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Did Jesus have a flood of what? Misunderstanding there? Did he not know what he was talking about? Was he delirious? Did he say, my God, and didn't know what he was talking about? Come on. My God. Jesus has a God. And that God is his Father. He said so several times. So what have we learned from Peter here? The real God, the one that talked to Peter and Jesus said, you've been blessed by my father. You didn't learn this any other place but from him, directly to you. God is a living God. That living God is the creator. Jesus is the son of the living God. They created together. The living God is his father. If he's the father, then he's the source of the son. The son is subject to the father. <laughs> and the son is divine the same way as the father is by inheritance. Jesus is the Christ. The Son is the Christ sent to be the Savior, the Mediator. The Father and the Son are two separate beings. Jesus is both human and divine. It will take a whole time to express that. All of this was revealed to Peter. And so when Jesus asked the question, he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. <laughs> and all Jesus could say to him was, You've been blessed. My Father is talking to you. <laughs> you got it right. <laughs> you got it right. My father showed you. We don't have time to discuss the next verse. I just wanted to get those two statements. But you know what the next verse is, don't you? Yeah. Thou art. See, he said, Thou art the Christ. Well, thou art Peter. <laughs> Simon. You're, you're Simon. The, Son of, no, it didn't say, he said, Bar Jonah. That means in the Hebrew, the son of Jonas. Okay. You're Peter. All I'm trying to show here is that Jesus said to Peter, Thou art. So I'm going to tell you who you are now. You're not who you used to be. You're working on that. You are stone but stone my father has talked to you and the fact that you believe what he told you this is the rock that I'm going to build my church on when people believe the father when he says this is my son The gates of hell will never prevail against that. 
You see how powerful this is? This little story there. It's everything we need to know right there. Jesus is our Savior. He's the Christ. He's the Son of the living God, the Creator. Let me try to finish with something here. Let's see if I can get there. Two, no, uh, one is P. One is P. 237. The Sabbath was to be a sign between God and his people forever. In this manner was it to be a sign all who should observe the Sabbath signified by such observance that they were worshippers of the living God. There it is. Peter got that. The living God. And every Sabbath worshiper is worshiping the true God, the living God. But you must be a Sabbath keeper, not a Saturday keeper. Only a holy person can keep the Sabbath holy. So here's Ellen White saying, they were worshipers of the living God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. The Sabbath was to be a sign between God and his people as long as he should have a people upon the earth to serve him. All right, let's try one last one and we'll close. Patriarchs and Prophets 307. The Sabbath is not introduced as a new institution. That Sinai is what you're talking about. But as having been founded at creation, it is to be remembered and observed as the memorial of the Creator's work, pointing to God as the maker of the heavens and the earth. It distinguishes the true God from all false gods. All who keep the seventh day signified by this act. They are worshipers of Jehovah. Do you know the seventh day Adventist people are no longer worshipers of Jehovah? Do you know who they worship now? Yahweh, a Sunday keeping God. Yahweh was invented by the Sunday keepers. There's so many things I would like to talk to you about. We don't have time to hit all the places. We have wandered away from God. And wandered away from the spirit of prophecy. All right. Thus the Sabbath is a sign of man's allegiance to God. As long as there are any upon the earth to serve him. The fourth commandment is the only one. Of all the ten in which are found both the name and the title of the lawgiver. It is the only one that shows by whose authority the law is given. Thus it contains the seal of God affixed to his law as evidence of its authenticity and binding force. The living God, the real God, always brings the Sabbath with him because it's the sign of who he is. The living God. There is no way that Satan, the spurious God, can be the living God because every church that he has taken away in apostasy until recent times, every church have the Trinity as their God. But there's something really devastating to think about. How in the world did the Seventh day Adventist Church get over that place? When that was not our work, our work was to show this, the Trinity God is from Satan. We better start thinking about these things. We're going to try to reinforce this as we move through now because now we're going to ask the question next time. Where is the thus saith the Lord for the Trinity? Father, we thank you once more that your word Tells us everything we need to know in the plan of salvation. You have preserved it for us. If we get careless and don't read it, 
That's our own choice. If we listen to other people instead of listening to your voice, that's another choice. Help us to hear your voice trying to break through to us. The thing we may not have learned yet is that the only way you talk is in a small whisper. You don't believe in knocking down doors. You don't believe in fireworks. You don't believe in all the things that people use to trap people. The still small voice. Help us to slow down, to listen, to study, and to cherish that small voice to our inner soul. We thank you in Jesus' precious name.